Hello, and welcome to the Human Cell Atlas Biological Network seminar. Today's seminar is focused on technology. Uh, a couple introductory slides before we uh, go, um, go in. So uh, please, uh, if you're not a member of the HCA, please join by following this link. Uh, and uh, once you join, please select any uh, of the 18 HCA biological networks um, to, to join and to help us uh, build the Atlas and participate actively in Atlas building efforts. Uh, if you have a publication that you would like to be included as uh, in the um, HCA branded publications, please uh, submit it using this link. Uh, this can help your paper gain more visibility. Uh, the upcoming HCA events, uh, we uh, hope to see you uh, on June 5th at the town hall, which is a virtual um, meeting. Uh, if you reside in Asia, please uh, register for HCA Asia Single Cell Omics Workshop. It's in person in Bangkok. The HCA General Meeting is in September in Milan. HCA Asia Meeting is in December in Hong Kong. And HCA General Meeting 2025 uh, will be in Singapore. Please stay tuned for the dates for that. Uh, if you're interested in supporting uh, this meetings, um, e either through sponsorship or through exhibitor opportunities, please email us. Uh, we have four talks today. Uh, for those of you watching us on YouTube or Billy Billy, please be advised that the second talk by Nikolaus Rayevsky will not be broadcast. We will not be recording it. Uh, today's uh, webinar and discussion are hosted by the co-chairs of the uh, Standards and Technology Working Group, Orit Rosenblatt-Rosen and Holger Hein, and they will also moderate today's discussion. Orit and Holger, please uh, join me in welcoming our speakers and introduce yourself. Thank you, Ellen, um, and welcome to a new episode of our HCA webinar series with a focus on technologies. So it's another, another to host another stellar lineup of speakers today, presenting an exciting mix of technologies. So today we will cover spatial genomics, we cover lineage tracing, perturbation screens, AI-driven analysis. Uh, let me remind you again to ask questions in the chat and to join our round table at the end of the webinar. Uh, there we will follow up questions with the, with the speakers. And without further delay, let me introduce our first speaker, Samantha Morris. Uh, Samantha is Associate Professor of Genetics and Developmental Biology at Washington University in St. Louis. Her laboratory studies the mechanism of cell reprogramming, focusing on how trans transcription factors drive gene expression, epigenetic, and function changes in cell identity. And her group is obviously very well known to develop amazing open source experimental and computational tools to record lineage and gene regulation during directed reprogramming. So today, today she will talk about new genomics technologies to deconstruct and control cell identity. Sam, an honor to have you today with us. Um, please take it from here. Thanks very much for the kind introduction and um, very uh, excited to present to you today um, some of the technologies we've been developing in the lab. Um, and really the motivation behind um, our development of these technologies is trying to understand how we can faithfully reprogram cell identity. And we can think of cell identity as a map to um, really explore. And we know we can reprogram cells to pluripotency, direct them to target identity. We know we can also take fully mature um, or differentiated cells and directly convert them to different identities with transcription factor overexpression. And that's what we're most interested in. Um, but 10 years ago now, we didn't have a systematic method to really measure the identity of these um, engineered cells. So we developed CellNet um, and found that directed differentiation um, results in cells that are developmentally immature, whereas direct reprogramming, so trying to switch between fully differentiated cell types, uh, the starting cell identity persists and the resulting cells are still developmentally immature, even though we were trying to avoid these, uh, these uh, developmental states. Uh, more recently, we've taken these cell identity measurements into the, the single cell era with our capybara method to be able to measure cell identity and fate transitions at single cell resolution. And we see the same issues with these protocols. Just now we see these issues at higher resolution. And ultimately, 
the practical utility of these engineered cells is limited because they just don't recapitulate the target cell identity. So we really want to understand how we can deconstruct cell identity to be able to increase reprogramming efficiency and fidelity. So this is the, the central goal of the lab. And now the prototypical lineage conversion we work with is this IEP reprogramming. So taking mouse embryonic fibroblasts, overexpressed in two transcription factors, FOXA1, HNF4 alpha, and shifting them into this so-called induced hepatocyte state. Um, but we knew from this 2011 uh, papers of highly reproducible, but there was a mystery cell identity underlying these cells. Uh, we generated the cells, ran the data through CellNet, so a bulk method to infer gene regulatory networks that we then used to be able to measure cell identity. And we found that these cells had underlying intestinal identity. And through a series of in vitro and in vivo experiments, and demonstrated that these cells were able to functionally engraft both liver and intestine long-term. So we renamed these cells induced endoderm progenesis. Um, it's a really fun protocol to work with, um, but extremely challenging because like most other protocols, very few of the initial starting population will successfully reprogram. And then a tiny percentage of the cells actually make it through to successful engraftment. But if we can piece this process together, then it would form a blueprint for engineering cell identity. And so to be able to trace the origins of these rare reprogramming events, um, back in 2018, we developed cell tagging. And um, so with cell tagging, we're introducing random barcodes into cells using lentivirus. Um, these transcripts are polyadenylated. So the barcodes are picked up um, in parallel with the rest of the single cell transcriptome. It's a very, very simple method. Um, and by sequentially labeling cells, we can build these rudimentary lineage trees. Um, and to cut a long story short here, so back um, you know, um, in 2018, we demonstrated from this ground truth lineage tracing data that there's two conversion trajectories. So one to a reprogrammed epithelialized cell identity and one into this dead end state. So these cells remain mesenchymal and we're gonna get more into this mechanism today. Um, but we showed, um, so back in 2019, that it's this reprogrammed population that successfully engrafts the, the damaged intestine. So we want to be able to push cells from this dead end onto this reprogrammed trajectory, or ideally just set the cells on the right trajectory from the beginning of the process. And we learned from this early reprogramming study, I'm gonna you know, finish on this at the end of the talk, um, that there's differences in these cell populations to begin with. So, you know, we really thought that these trajectories were set later in the reprogramming process, but now we've come to realize and the field has come to realize that these trajectories are set very early on in the process. So setting out to ask the question of when is this heterogeneity established during reprogramming, we take a gene regulatory network uh, perspective again. And so GRNs are master regulators of cell identity. Um, as reprogrammers, we love using transcription factors to change cell identity. So, so this is the perspective we've, we've traditionally taken. And um, we developed cell oracle. Um, to, to be able to get at this question. Um, so with cell oracle, we use single cell attack seek and single cell RNA seq to be able to infer gene regulatory networks. And then using these gene regulatory networks, we're then able to simulate changes in cell identity following transcription factor perturbation. Um, so with cell oracle, you know, I like to emphasize cell oracle is not about the gene regulatory network. So there's many methods to be able to infer GRNs. It's just the way we use those GRNs to be able to interrogate the regulation of cell identity. So the main output of cell oracle is not the GRN, it's actually the cell state transition vectors following gene perturbation. So we can understand how cell identity shifts upon transcription factor overexpression, but also transcription factor knockout. Um, so using the cell oracle method, um, we, we teamed up with our cell tagging technology to be able to identify cells um, that were destined to reprogram versus cells that were destined to go into the dead end from these early stages. We don't see many transcriptional differences, and I'm going to come back into this. But using cell oracle, we inferred the GRNs um, for these early network states and could link it to these fates and find that they're wired quite differently. And for example, FOS is highly connected um, in the cells that do successfully reprogram, and FOS has a role in everything. Um, so with cell oracle, we were able to simulate the effects of adding FOS to the reprogramming cocktail and found that it's predicting that cells will move more swiftly through the reprogramming process and um, potentially switch from these dead end cells into a reprogrammed fate. Um, and we published this uh, early last year and um, through a lot of experimental validation, we're able to give further insight into the mechanism of this and actually validate that FOSS um, improves the base cocktail. 
And so our model from, from uh, these earlier studies is that reprogramming fate is determined much earlier than we previously expected. So these trajectories are set early, and I will return to this later. And um, we see these two, um, these two trajectories to these different fates. But the challenges of these early studies that we didn't capture enough clones in these early stages of reprogramming, so these studies uh, were underpowered, and um, also the transcriptome isn't everything. So as I said, we weren't seeing many transcriptional differences in these, these early stages. Um, but when we use the GRN inference by incorporating that attack seek data, then we start to see um, key differences in these trajectories. So what are we missing here? Um, well, promotin accessibility is something we were keen to be able to integrate into our lineage tracing. So this project was led by um, my former graduate student, now Kunal, um, and it's based on the traditional cell tagging methodology. So picking up these barcoded transcripts in parallel with the single cell transcriptome. Um, but Kunal also developed the method so that we could pick up these barcodes um, via single cell attack seek. So you can detect promising accessibility, gene expression, and lineage in parallel. And um, so we can see, capture the barcodes across both assays. And also we can co call clones across both, both assays. So this is a co-embedding of the RNA and attack seek data. And um, so now we can ask with this technology, what are the early gene regulatory changes that set cells onto these specific reprogrammed and dead end um, trajectories? And um, so we take our MEFs, induce the reprogramming factors at the end of this period, we cell tag the cells, and then we allow them to expand for three days. So we get you know, lots of clonal expansion in these first three days and then recover 50% of that population. So this is our state sample. We then replate the rest of the cells and collect again at days 12 and 21. These are our fate samples. So once we know reprogramming outcome. And what we can do is from the clones on day three that successfully reprogram, we can identify um, their early siblings. And we can also identify these clones um, at early stages of day three that would then move into the dead end and reconstruct their early gene regulatory changes. Looking at gene expression uh, from these day three reprograms and dead end destined cells, we see some differences, but it gets really interesting when we infer transcription factor activity from the chromatin accessibility data. And um, so on the day three reprogrammed trajectory, we see with variant activity for the reprogramming factors themselves, FOXA1, HNF4 alpha. The simple explanation for this is that we see um, significant differences in transgene expression levels. Uh, I think there's a lot more to this story. So kind of watch the space um, in that respect. Now, focusing more on the dead end, because we never paid uh, too much attention to this previously, and we infer that ZFP281, this transcription factor that never came to us from gene expression studies before, we infer that it's highly active in the early stages on this dead end trajectory. And so looking more closely at ZFP281, so its, it's role um, in biology generally, we find that it drives a mesenchymal-like dormancy program in the context of breast cancer. And this caught our attention because the hallmark of the dead end is that these cells are stuck in a mesenchymal-like state. So to test this in further detail, we added ZFP281 to our Fox HNF reprogramming cocktail. We also knocked it down, performed single cell RNA-seq. We used our capybara, capybara method to score cell identity in an unbiased way and found that with knockdown, we pushed cells toward the reprogrammed trajectory and also pulled the cells away um, from this dead end trajectory. So, so this is our desired outcome. And from also looking further into mechanism by inferring signaling activity, we find that overexpression of ZFP281 is associated with um, enhanced uh, TGF beta signaling. Uh, when we block TGF beta signaling using a small molecule inhibitor, we can guide a lot more cells onto that successful reprogramming trajectory. So, this offers a, a, a small vignette of how these multiomic lineage tracing technologies can help us um, dissect mechanism and drive cells toward that desired identity. And um, so what's driving this initial reprogramming outcome? So I said there's much more um, FOXA1, HNF4 alpha transcription factor activity inferred in the early stages on this reprogramming trajectory, and that we see significant differences in transgene expression levels. Um, and I think this story is much more complex, but this is just a, a simple version of it. And um, we hypothesize um, that high transgene expression leads to on-target reprogramming. And so we think that FOXA1 may homodimerize and target a particular set of genes um, in that circumstance, whereas at low transgene expression levels, there could be heterodimerization of FOXA1 with AP1 factors, for example, initiating um, this, this off-target or dead-end reprogramming. 
Um, so we're looking at this um, recruitment of different cofactors depending on the FOX uh, A1 expression levels and also the stoichiometry between FOX A1 and HNF4 alpha. Ideally, we need to measure transcription factor binding in these early stages of reprogramming, but it's really challenging because we don't see many expression changes by day three. So we don't have any way to prospectively isolate these cells. So we have to rely on this retrospective identification. Um, so this is where our single cell calling card technology comes in. And this is a project uh, led by my graduate student, Snow. Um, in the lab. And calling cards are where we fuse a piggyback transpose A to a transcription factor of interest. So in this case, Fox A1, HNF4 alpha. Um, so individually. Um, and then um, wherever this calling card um, binds, it inserts a self-reporting transposon. So this reports the genomic location of binding. Um, it produces a transcript for this that's captured in parallel with the rest of the single cell transcriptome. And this allows us to record binding in the first two days of reprogramming. But then we just allow the cells to naturally reprogram and we can read out the binding later around about day 14 once this reprogramming is known. So retrospectively identifying these cells. And so no, SNOW has recorded FOXA1 binding at reprogramming initiation, and we validated uh, that we get a nice FOXA1 signal from this, and then she reads out um, the binding at day 14. So this is kind of looking into the binding history. And she identifies different sets of co-occurring motifs depending on transgene expression levels. So at high levels of FOXH and F expression, we see more liver-like transcription factor um, co-motif um, occurrence. And at mid-levels, we're seeing some of the AP1 factors pop up here. So we're diving um, a little bit more into this mechanism now. Um, so in summary, our current model of IEP reprogramming, so with the transcriptome-only based method of cell tagging, we could nicely identify these two trajectories based on ground truth lineage tracing data. And then the cell tag multi has really allowed us to dive into mechanisms and within the first three days of reprogramming. So we see high transgene expression and engagement of FOXA targets on the successfully reprogrammed trajectory, whereas in this dead end, we see engagement of the ZFP281 um, TGF beta axis failure of these cells to epithelialize, leading to this off-target identity, but we can push these cells um, onto this successful route. And um, so now the big question that we're going after is exactly when is reprogramming fate determined? We thought it was day 21, then day six, we're back to day three here. It's predetermined in the population of cells um, that you're introducing those reprogramming factors into. Um, and we know this from our reprogramming lineages. Also, many um, additional studies are, are supporting this idea. Um, so with our rudimentary lineages, um, we see a clone of cells tagged when they were MEFs at day zero. And um, we then can identify these subclones that were tagged at day three. So these are deriving from a common ancestor. And then also further subclones derived um, from these common ancestors at day 13. Um, if reprogramming is a stochastic process, you would expect, expect these sublineages to do different things. So to go into the dead end in different proportions, to die, to remain as fibroblasts. And that's really not what we see. We see that clonally related cells share reprogramming outcome from the initiation of transcription factor overexpression. When we split siblings, though, across independent biological replicates, they no longer share reprogramming outcome. And so it's suggesting to us that these trajectories are established at reprogramming initiation, that cells transition through these permissive states that last for a few divisions where they're just in the mood to reprogram. And I think this is a really important mechanism to dissect. Um, so I'll just finish up on this slide now. So our three re possible reprogramming origins. Um, so we have either a stable heritable state, so a stable cell type within this population that reprograms deterministically, or we have this transient heritable state that I've just described, or that reprogramming is completely stochastic. And so now we're dissecting this through methods, new methods for high resolution lineage tracing and trying to really understand the mechanisms of this state. Um, there's you know, a lot of support for the idea of transient heritability in the field now. Um, so particularly from Arjun Raj's lab, so describing this memory on intermediate timescales in the context of cancer and also a really um, beautiful recent paper from his lab describing this in the context of reprogramming. So we are excited to see that. Um, with that, I'd like to thank my lab, uh, my collaborators, our funding sources, and um, I look forward to questions later. Thank you. And now we'll move to our next speaker.
And it is my uh, pleasure to introduce Eric Lubeck. So I'll tell you a little bit about Eric. Eric holds a PhD in biophysics from Caltech, where he pioneered spatial transcriptomics technologies to explore tissue biology. Following his time at Caltech, Eric undertook a postdoctoral fellowship in bioengineering at UCSF in Stanford, focusing on the development of synthetic biology tool via CRISPR screens. Eric then joined in Citro, where he played a key role in developing a phenotypic drug discovery platform. When then he combined microscopy, functional genomics, and machine learning to deeply phenotype cells. Currently, Eric's efforts at Genentech are dedicated to pushing the boundaries of spatial genomics and screening technologies with the goal of opening new paths for biology discovery. So today, Eric will talk about highly multiplex image-based pool screens in primary cells and tissues with a new method called Perturb View. Uh, so welcome, Eric, and we really look forward to your talk. Hi, everyone. Let's see, let me just share this. It's my screen. we go. All right. Hi, everyone. So today I'm going to tell you about our new technology called Perturb View. So you can everyone see my cursor? I believe so. Yes, we can see it. So a brief intro. Image-based screens are a very powerful tool for understanding biology. The current way we do a lot of image-based screens is we basically have one perturbation, one chemical, or often one virus per well. We'll have many wells on a plate, the limitation here is that if we want to be able to do a genome-wide screen, it basically means having many, many plates with many replicates for every single perturbation we might want. With that limitation, though, these methods are quite powerful. They give us orthogonal information to a lot of the sequencing-based experiments we've been talking about. about. We can look at things like protein localization, morphology, cell-cell interactions, and live cell microscopy. But the bandwidth here is really limited. So a few years ago, Paul Mulaney's lab came up with this great way of doing cool CRISPR screens actually with a microscope. The idea here is that each cell is infected with its own guide RNA. We can do whatever phenotypic assay we want on those cells. And then instead of each perturbation going to a well, now the perturbations are inside of a single cell and we can actually read those out via in-situ sequencing. What this means is that we can effectively have a genome-wide screen over just a few plates really cutting down experimental size. And that gives us the ability to do more and more complex phenotyping on top of these optical experiments. So now we can start thinking about things like, can we work with multiplex proteomics, spatial transcriptomics, a lot of these new methods that are coming out that are really information rich. Now, this is an amazing technology, but there is a limitation with it. Currently, so far, it's really only been successfully applied in cancer cell lines. Primary, uh, prior efforts have been unsuccessful in primary cells. The reason for this is that we're delivering the guide RNA barcode via lentivirus. And lentiviruses just generally tend to be a little higher expressed in cancer cells and a lot of primary cells of interest. We then go and actually convert this barcode into a fluorescent readout, which is a pretty inefficient process. So many RNA are gonna turn into just a few spots. If you start with fewer RNA, you're gonna have no spots in the cell. So that's just a false negative cell now. So this makes it very hard to actually do screens in a lot of the cells that we care about of interest. Other challenges are combining this method with a lot of different phenotyping methods. The more kind of uh, optical readouts we do before OPS, so readouts like looking at RNA protein and cell painting, the more it actually depletes these optical pooled screening barcodes, which makes it pretty hard to multiplex these methods together. And then the other limitation is that this has only really been applied well in cell culture in our hands. We really need methods that can move into more complex systems like organoids and tissues going forward. So we set out in collaboration with the V. Regev's lab to create a new method called Perturb View. The idea here was 
can we basically circumvent all these limitations simultaneously so we can do the same experiments in in vitro and in vivo models combined with any optical phenotyping method and then read out in any system of interest? We're building on a method from Michael Ellis's lab called Zombie. The idea on this Zombie method is to basically amplify barcodes that are transcriptionally silent with T7 RNA polymerase. So they're inserting a T7 RNA polymerase promoter into the chromosome. When T7 RNA polymerase is added to methanol fixed cells, you get these really bright spots where these are transcribed in the nucleus. So this is a really powerful system, but it wasn't really used for OPS-like readouts. We wanted to know, is this gonna work in lentivirally derived barcodes? Can we port this to actually in-situ sequencing for looking at guide RNAs? And can we adapt this to formaldehyde fixed cells, which are really essential for a lot of our phenotyping efforts? So the idea for our perturbed view technology is really simple. We're taking a standard crop seek vector, which many people use for CRISPR perturbation experiments. And inside of the U6 promoter, which drives a guide RNA, we're trying to insert a T7 promoter. The idea here is that in live cells, U6 is gonna continue making the guide RNA driving CRISPR editing, but in dead cells, we'll be able to add T7 to drive guide RNA detection. So Taka and Aviv's lab did a tremendous amount of work actually finding promoter variants that were gonna work for this. We screened a lot of different promoter variants where we inserted T7 in different sites around U6. And then we measure the knockout efficiency. So is this still working for CRISPR perturbations? And then the uh, in, vitro activity, in vitro transcription activity as measured by the nuclear intensity here. So this is how bright the spots got after we added T7. In this case, we have many variants that retain U6 activity and a few variants with very high IVT activity. So we chose one of these for our perturbed view experiments. On the right here, you can see it's just a few nucleotides different from the wild type U6 promoter. But now with these differences, when we add T7 RNA polymerase, we get these huge bright nuclear spots. So this method works in every cell line we've so far tested this in. On the top here, we have standard optical pooled screening method, looking at eye astrocytes, fibroblast, eye neurons, uh, BMDMs and primary human T cells. And on the bottom, we have our perturbed view data here, which gives us this bright nuclear signal. At the bottom here, we're quantifying whether these signals can actually be seen in different cells. So for astrocytes, actually standard OPS works fine. Fibroblast, same story. As we move to many of these other cell types, the efficiency starts taking a big hit for standard OPS. Perturbed view is generally uniformly giving us around 70 to 80% efficiency here. One other thing I want to point out is even though we're counting a lot of these cells in standard OPS as true positives, it's very hard to segment out these cells and actually assign the guide RNA in a real experiment. While in the perturbed view method, we get these bright nuclear foci that are very hard, very easy to assign. So it really makes experiments a lot easier. So as a proof of concept for this method, we did a P65 translocation screen in primary mouse BMDM cells, which is the first primary cell uh, OPS screen that's been published in the literature. So we're taking a Cas9 mouse, transducing with a small library, and then activating the cells with different cytokines or LPS and looking at guide RNA signal and P65 and immunofluorescence. One thing I want to point out immediately is that in BMDM cells, we get about a 50% decrease when we do OPS versus perturbed view. But when we actually combine these phenotyping methods like immunofluorescence on top of conventional OPS, we take even more of a hit. So the more phenotyping you do with these standard methods, the bigger hit you take. While with perturbed view, we basically get no hits, uh, no hit to efficiency. In all of these different set stimulations, we recover the expected genes. So for TNF stimulation, we're seeing the biggest phenotype with the TNF receptor. Same for IL-1 stimulation. The IL-1 receptor is the biggest hit. And for LPS, we see a lot of core NF-kappa B pathways as significant hits here. One of the other really exciting areas we're moving into now is combining this method with spatial biology for actually being able to do in vivo screening. 
So we did some preliminary experiments as a proof of concept here. We took a DLD1 colorectal cancer cell line transduced with guide RNAs, placed it in a mouse xenograph, then did zinium spatial transcriptomics prior to our perturbed view method. So this is what the data from our experiments looks like. We basically can zoom in and we see these bright dots which correspond to actually individual guide RNAs and cells. When we go on to actually measure how efficient we are recovering these guide RNAs, we're able to see with convention, uh, with perturbed view, both in FFPE and fresh frozen, a pretty high recovery of our library and a reasonable efficiency of actually cells with guide RNAs. So we currently think this is about 50% detection efficiency in tissue. FFPE does take a bigger hit. And we're also able to recover our library pretty well comparing to NGS experiments here. This is what our data from our experiment actually looks like. So on the right, we have raw unprocessed data of just in situ sequencing, where we can watch these change over time. One thing I wanna point out is it's really easy to decode these experiments. It's not a lot of hard image processing. This is literally raw data and you can very easily see the bases changing in this tissue over time. We've built a bunch of pipelines to decode this data here. So now we actually have the guide RNAs across the tissue as pseudo colored here. We can see areas of the tissue that are pretty high diversity and then areas of the tissue with lots of clonal growth occurring in them. So relatively low diversity areas of the tissue. We next went on to actually quantify this. So now we're taking our guide RNA clonal map and we're converting this into a Shannon diversity index. This is measuring the diversity of clones in individual areas of the tissue. We have areas of very high clonal diversity and areas of relatively low clonal diversity in the tissue too. This is practically what low versus high clonal diversity actually looks like. And then we can measure using our Zygium spatial transcriptomics, which genes are actually associated with low clonal, low versus high clonal diversity. We see a lot of uh, EMT associated genes actually associated with low clonal diversity. And the inference there is that these are probably fast growing areas of the tumor that are actually undergoing EMT as we're capturing them here. So great, and just a summary of what we presented. We have a method for doing optical in vitro screens of cell intrinsic phenotypes. We can now look at cell extrinsic phenotypes in organoids and mouse models. And this method can really easily be combined with basically any different optical method we're interested in, RNA, protein, DNA, and live cell microscopy. Cool, and thanks to everyone who helped supervise this work, Aviv and Arit, and of course, Taka for actually doing all the work here. Thank you, Eric, Thank you. for a fantastic. Thank you, Eric, for a fantastic talk. Really uh, nice work. And now we're going to turn to our uh, last talk for uh, this uh, seminar series. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Maria Brubeck. Maria is an assistant professor of computer science and by courtesy of life sciences at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne. EPFL. Maria develops new machine learning methods and applies her methods to advanced biology and biomedicine. Her methods have been used by Global Cell Atlas Consortia efforts aiming to create reference maps for all cell types. These include the Human Biomolecular Atlas Program or HubMap and Fly Cell Atlas Consortium. Um, Today, Maria is going to talk about towards a AI-driven discoveries and single-cell genomics. So thank you for joining us, Maria, and we look forward to your talk. And just uh, to remind everyone, we're going to have a discussion with all the speakers as a panel discussion after Maria's talk, so stay tuned. Thank you so much, for a okay. nice introduction, and thanks so much for inviting me. I'm uh, really excited to be here. Uh, so the title of my talk today is Towards AI-Driven Discoveries in Single-Cell Genomics. So with the advances of single-cell sequencing technologies, we can nowadays measure gene expressions in hundreds of thousands of individual cells. And not only that we can measure transcriptome on the single-cell level, but with the multi-omics technologies, we can even perform multi-modal measurements and look at different aspects of the cell, such as chromatin, protein, and transcriptome. And recent spatial technologies allow us even to look at the spatial organization of uh, cells. 
And given this huge amount of data that kind of it's being generated, that kind of machine learning holds a promise for transforming biomedical research and really becoming a driving force of new discoveries in biology. But this poses a technological challenge on how can we go towards AI or ML methods that indeed enable these new biomedical discoveries and can be used to gain new insights in this case, for example, from single cell genomics data sets. So what technology is needed to achieve that? So single cell genomics data is very heterogeneous. We generate data sets across different labs, patients, tissues, species, and modalities. So to en enable deriving new biological insights from these data sets, we need machine learning methods that can generalize across heterogeneous experiments and modalities. And secondly, we need methods that can kind of go towards this new discovering these new phenomena that have not been previously characterized. So we really need to go to, to, towards kind of machine learning paradigm that enables these new discoveries. And in this talk, I will kind of give a brief journey kind of covering methods that we have been developing um, in past years to address us these challenges. So I will first present methods kind of that go towards this ability to be able to kind of generalize across uh, different experiments. So to enable learning across heterogeneous experiments, we developed a method that we call MARS. And the key idea in MARS was to leverage a collection of previously annotated single cell data sets to help that are kind of abundantly available to help us to generalize to a new experiment. And by leveraging previously annotated data, Mars is able to kind of learn representations that allow us hopefully to distinguish between cell types in a new data set. So in particular, Mars method takes as input kind of set of previously annotated single cell data generated, for example, from different tissues. So these data sets can be very heterogeneous. And then given a new unannotated data sets, it kind of maps all these data sets into joint in low dimensional embedding space that allow us to learn better representation for this new unannotated data set and distinguish between these cell types in a new data set. And we applied Mars to uh, the mouse aging cell atlas data sets and show that Mars can effectively utilize data set generate, generated across different tissues to generalize better to our new unseen tissue data set. And Mars is also applicable, for example, to data set generated across different time points. So in, collabor in collaboration with Lich in Lua's lab, we've been applying Mars to discover neuronal types across a fly brain development. And finally, by transferring annotations, we can also transfer annotations, for example, across different, different sequencing technologies. So within the Fly Cell Atlas um, Consortium, we uh, co uh, contributed to establishing first single cell transcriptomic map of the fly uh, by characterizing over 250 fly cell types. And most recently, we also developed the Fly Aging Cell Atlas, the first single cell transcriptomic map of the aging fly uh, in collaboration with Honji Lee's lab and Li Chin Luo and Stephen Quake's labs. And while Mars is able to leverage these heterogeneous experiments, it still requires the gene sets to be shared across these data sets. But the question is, can we go towards kind of universal cell embeddings and create cell embeddings for any species, any set of genes? And why is it important? So this would enable us, for example, to perform cross-species analysis. And by bringing together data sets across different species, we can study on a single cell level conservation and diversification of cell types across species, and hopefully unravel how cellular diversity links to anatomical and physiological variation across species. And with this goal in mind, we developed a method that we call Saturn. And this is a joint work with two amazing students, Yanai Rosen and Yusuf Rohani. And what Saturn is doing, it is able to take as inputs data set generated across different species, and then it learns to project them into the same embedding space. And the key idea here is that we need to enable somehow, th that we enable to encode the meanings of genes in our model, and we don't represent genes just as the columns in our data matrix. So in particular, to kind of encode biological properties of genes, we use protein language models and then we map all genes across different species to a joint space that we call a macrogene space. So the idea is basically that we learn these weights uh, in a way that they kind of reflect the similarity of, uh, of protein embeddings of uh, these genes. And each macrogene will represent kind of groups of functionally related genes. Um, and in this way, we can map all the genes that are generated across different species data sets to a joint macrogene space.
And once we put all these data sets into joint space, we can go towards kind of universal embeddings and map all these different data sets in the same space. And this is just an example of applying Saturn to integrate data sets from zebra, fish, and frog. So if we, for example, apply existing batch correction methods, they severely fail because this is a really hard problem. But if we apply, for example, Saturn, um, we see that in the Saturn case, the, the embeddings are indeed kind of species heterogeneous, and we see um, alignment. Uh, we see that uh, cell types that um, are conserved across species are well aligned. And this is just visualization of the Saturn embeddings by coloring cells based on the cell type. So in this case, you can see that Saturn embeddings are also cell type homogeneous, which, for example, is not the case for another uh, species integration methods where you can see the different kind of cell types um, are uh, mixed together in the same cluster. And Saturn also allows us to redefine differential expression for cross-species analysis. So we can, for example, ask the question, which macrogenes are differentially expressed across species and characterize cell type specific macrogenes. So to interpret biological meaning of a macrogene, each macrogene is represented by genes that have high weight to that uh, particular, uh, to that particular mi macrogene. As an example, we can look, for example, at macrogenes that are differentially expressed in the frog and zebrafish ionocytes. Um, here we find the differential expressed microgenes for ionocytes indeed consist of genes that are ionocytes markers. For example, one microgene consists of these FOXY transcription factor genes that are indeed involved in cell type differentiation during embryogenesis. And the output of the Saturn basically looks like uh, every microgene would be microgene would be described with a set of genes that have these high weights to these uh, microgenes. In this in case, the FOXY transcription factor genes. And at the second part of my talk, I want to go talk more kind of how can we go towards this kind of discovering new and unknown phenomena. So in our standard machine learning paradigm, we typically assume that the world is known to us. But in reality, there are many kind of novel and unknown uh, things that we have not been able, for example, label and characterize. And this is especially case in scientific applications. For example, there may be some seen and uh, known cell types, but also there is a huge space of kind of rare and novel cell types that we ideally want to be able to discover. So given label data, for example, in this case, fibroblasts and cardiomyocytes, and if I want to, I, what I ideally want to have is, is that if someone gives me kind of new unlabeled data where there may be, again, these fibroblasts and cardiomyocytes that have been labeled to annotate in my reference label data before, but if there are some new cell types that I have not been able to characterize before, for example, these green cells, I ideally want my learning algorithm to say that this is a novel cell type one, and these purple cells are novel cell type two. So I want to have the ability to discover these novel classes and at the same time automatically identify existing classes. And in particular, we aim to solve this problem on a spatially resolved single cell data and also learn embeddings that help us to capture both the spatial organizations of the cells as well as their molecular features. And with this goal in mind, we developed a method that we call Stellar. So what Stellar does, and this is the joint work with Heidi Tsao and uh, John Hickey. So what Stellar does is it can take as an input reference a labeled annotated tissue and then non-labeled and annotated tissue. And then we construct the cell graph based on the spatial proximities of the cells. And using graph neural networks, we encode kind of by law, uh, we encode, um, we learn embeddings that capture both the spatial si uh, similarity of the uh, cells as well as, the, as well as their molecular features. And finally, we design kind of objective function that allow us to say whether a cell belonged to previously seen and known cell types, or it can potentially be a novel cell type. And in particular, we applied Stellar to annotate, uh, to transfer annotation from a cancer donor tissue, uh, from healthy donor tissue to a cancer donor tissue. So this is an example of applying Stellar to codex multiplex imaging data, but it is also uh, applicable to spatial transcriptomics data sets as well. So in this case, this is a healthy tonsil data generated in Gary Nolan lab. Um, and here cells are colored based on the cell type they come from. And we wanted to transfer annotation from this healthy tonsil tissue to this esophageal cancer data that we have not, um, that is uh, completely unlabeled. And we show that stellar predictions uh, near perfectly agree with the ground truth annotation. So, and this cyan color denotes like a major novel cell type that stellar was able to discover. 
And encouraged by these results, we uh, also apply Stellar to annotate the human intestine atlas. So, so far, Stellar within the HubMap consortium. So, so far, Stellar has been used to annotate over 2.6 million spatially resolved cells. And this is an example of visualization of Stellar predictions. And we also validate these predictions uh, by looking uh, the agreement between the human annotate, uh, between uh, marker genes uh, that um, are expressed in the cell types um, identified by Stellar and whether they agree with, um, with um, human expert annotations. And today, I just, in the last part, I just want to kind of give a kind of brief overview of the very recent uh, methods that we've been working on. So, to, so today, we really kind of stand of this, um, at the dawn of this era of foundation model, which is a paradigm shift that really promises to redefine the boundaries of AI research. But how can we leverage these representations from foundation models to kind of enable us new discoveries? So when we look at our current paradigms, they still require supervision. So kind of the standard paradigm is that we fine tune the model on the task of interest using label data. So what I would do is I would take my data set, I would take my big foundation model, and then I would kind of train a linear classifier to separate between uh, examples in my label data. So obviously I need kind of some set of label data sets in order to solve a new task. Alternatively, I can perform kind of zero shot transfer without label data, but still I need kind of human instruction set. For example, clip open AI model, which is a very famous zero shot model, um, is kind of takes the image encoder and, and then kind of takes the text encoder that kind of describes uh, possible uh, categories. And then it matches the aligns, the kind of image encoder and the text encoder. Uh, but in this case, we kind of still need these text descriptions of the classes. So my point here is that this paradigm is still not suitable for new discoveries because we still need a text description of these novel classes, although we don't need exactly the label data. So the question we ask in our like very recent work, and this is a work with my first PhD student, Artyom Gadetsky, is how can we infer these underlying classes without any supervision? And to effectively utilize representations of foundation models for new discoveries, we basically redefine the unsupervised learning problem as the problem of performing search over kind of possible labelings of a data set. But how can we guide this search? And the key idea of our approach is that we perform a search for such labeling in which kind of linear models will generalize well. And this is motivated by the way supervised fine tuning is currently done by adding kind of linear classifier on top of a pre-trained representations of a foundation model. So we can take a data set D, we can feed it through one or multiple foundation models. And then what we will do, we will kind of search over different possible labelings of a data set to find such labeling in which linear model will generalize well. And this search is kind of a discrete optimization problem. So we uh, resort to a continuous optimization. So instead of doing discrete search over labeling, we reformulate the problem to perform continuous search over parameters of a task encoder. And we showed that this method that we call Turtle, we did experimental, extensive experimental uh, benchmarks by performing a, by uh, comparing it to the, in comparing it to the clip zero shot model. And we show that impressively this method is kind of, without using any supervision, it uh, is kind of achieving same performance when trained in the clip space, same performance as the clip. But if we add multiple foundation model, for example, second foundation model, it is able to outperform zero shot models uh, without using any text encoder or information about the new classes. And we also show that uh, this is also applicable, for example, for single cell data. So you can also kind of, uh, because what the method is doing is just kind of training linear classifiers on top of the pre-trained representation. So you can take kind of on single cell foundation models and uh, do uh, the, this search over the possible labelings. And finally, I would like to thank my lab and my collaborators with whom I, I had the pleasure to work with on these projects and uh, as well as others. So looking forward to discussion and thank you so much for the attention. Great. Thank you, Maria, for a fantastic talk. And uh, let's take this opportunity and thank all the speakers for the wonderful uh, talks that they gave and that we were able to hear this today, I guess this morning, this afternoon, tonight, whatever, wherever you are. Um, and now we're moving to our uh, panel discussion. So I think if all the speakers can come back and turn on their cameras. Okay.
And then if there are questions to the panel, please uh, add them in the questions and uh, Q and A uh, box so Holger and I can moderate. So we'll start off with our first question. Um, and that is how available are the technologies and the ML AI methods that you talked about for wide use by the community? And are these uh, methods scalable? Nikolaus talked a little bit about it, but we will be happy, happy to hear from all of you about what you think. I don't know who wants to start. Maybe Nikolaus. Well, I'll talk, uh, I'll answer your question for what I presented. Uh, so I think we are limited uh, by um, uh, the sequencing costs. Um, that is a, the from a financial point of view, the the, um, the leading one. But since uh, now some patents are uh, ending and uh, more technologies enter the market and the sequencing prices are falling, um, I think we are, uh, that's okay. Uh, um, of course, scaling uh, in a clinical sense, uh, uh, you want to use uh, FFPE samples and uh, that is something that we are working on. So I don't know if, if that uh, will work out or, or not, but there are examples of using um, polyadenylate, uh, uh, using uh, polymerases which add a poly A tail to, to the RNA and then you can still get uh, very useful information from by sequencing from um, uh, FFP samples. Maybe I can rephrase that question for Maria um, because cell numbers always are an issue and now we are talking about foundation models so if, if numbers now scale in the next years to billions of cells mm -hmm. Would that improve models and what would change for you in the analysis? Yeah, I think uh, compared to uh, kind of vision models and like large language models, we are still kind of uh, in the single cell foundation models are not that large still. And it makes sense because we have, I mean, uh, most of them are trained on like cell census data, which is like 50 million cells. So I mean, in like vision or a language, this is like really small data sets. Um, and I think um, with billions of cells, uh, we ideally want to see kind of these uh, scaling lows that we see in large language models that the performance of these models kind of improves uh, with increases in model size and data size. But I think that larger data sets in general can help the model to uh, learn a kind of a wider range of patterns and concepts in the data. But I think it's also for single cell and kind of biology in general, it's not also only about the scale but also about the diversity of the data that we put into these models. So for example, I think it's really important what type of data we feed into these models and what maybe what type of data we need to generate uh, for these models to generalize well. So ideally we need data sets that are generated, I don't know, across different, very different tissues, across uh, different species, different disease states, developmental stages, perturbation data sets, uh, are extremely like useful, right? Because they kind of ideally, uh, allow the model to reason about if I perturb this gene, how, how will the response of other genes change? Uh, and I think that in general, I think we really need to think about like maybe not only about the numbers, but also on the type of data uh, we need to generate and we need, want to fit eventually into, into these models. And Niklas, how fast do you think we, we reach that, that billion cells? Because now with the spatial transcriptomics, you're imaging like hundred thousands of cells at the same time, right? So then is it kind of information content per cell, the limitation factor? Or? Yeah, that's a really good question, Holger. I'm, uh, I uh, I don't know. I think we're with a, a single cell analysis, at least in space, we are now easily reaching uh, millions of cells in one experiment, um, as I showed. And um, uh, I think the information contents per cell um, is not uh, going up at the same rate as we are adding more cells to the to the system. So there are several components uh, missing in in our analysis. So it's not only RNA; is, is there, there are lots of other things happening. And this is a very deep discussion. Uh, I don't know if we have more time to go into this, but uh, I find it very interesting and inspiring to think about other levels which are also there and which can be used as 
to make predictions or readouts. Yeah, maybe uh, Eric wants to, to comment a little bit about limitations and challenges that you encounter with your current technology, for example. How will you apply it to more complex systems, for example, more about tissues and organoids and so forth? Sure. Well, the advantage of these optical methods is they scale really fast so we can get to these really large cell numbers, you know, tens of millions of cells potentially per experiment. But I think the limitation, well, at least one there is on actually the computational methods for making sense of this data. We're really good at analyzing single cell data and mass, single cell sequencing data. But actually looking at single cell optical data at large scale is something where kind of the tools are still bespoke and we really need as a community to build tool sets that are really going to scale for eventually plugging this data into foundational models. Another thing I'll say is as we do these tissue perturbation experiments, the statistical methods for making sense about whether a perturbation is penetrating inside of a tissue depends both on you know, sampling the tissue really extensively and also measuring the three-dimensional microenvironment, which a lot of these techniques are currently lacking. So I think we really need to close those gaps before we can really start making sense of tissue biology with these perturbation-based methods. And looking, Eric, at you and Samantha's tool sets, how much do you think can be translated, transferred to HCA, human cell atlas data? Um, where maybe a surrogate marker like mitochondrial DNA mutations, genetic variation can be used kind of to kind of copy paste your tool set from an in vitro in vivo mouse model to a human human data set. Yeah, it's always hard to bridge mouse to human, and every question is a little bit bespoke and requires finagling the data just right to make sure you're not overfitting the biology. But I do think we can learn a lot about the human biology from the mouse models here. And a lot of these models were actually taking human cells and growing them in a humanized mouse system. So we have the opportunity to bridge quite a bit there. I think we lost the um, mention, right? Um, no, here, I'm or? here. Um, oh. I My connection is just quite slow, so I stopped my video. Um, so the tornado yeah. come, uh, came eventually? <laughs> no, no, the tornado. <laughs> has passed now thankfully um yeah so let me try my video just uh um if it gets a bit choppy i can um stop it um yeah so i don't think it's simple to translate our lentivirus based technologies to human obviously because we can't tag and trace uh cells in a human context so we can certainly use um you know modeling of human development with organoid systems and you know deploy some of these lineage tracing methods there um, but if we want to understand real in vivo human biology, it becomes very challenging because we are relying more on mitochondrial mutations. So we're looking at that endpoint sampling. Um, there's no real way, unless you can do some kind of liquid biopsy, um, to reconstruct these kinds of state fate analyses to look into a cell's past. So more of these retrospective analyses it's it's extremely challenging and I, I think that's the big problem we have at the moment and also you know single cell genomic barcoding approaches um we lose a lot of spatial information and we're also relying on distant relatives of cells to read out that prior cell state um so i, I think there's a huge opportunity for live in, imaging based methods but again translating that into you know fully functioning intact human systems is is a huge technical challenge and in some cases impossible and going back to to some of the spatial uh, aspects so cell segmentation really remains a challenge for sequence based spatial methods nicolaus um, do you think this would be a major limitation or later on or how, how are you thinking over overcoming these challenges yeah, so I think segmentation is, is still an unsolved problem in in, uh, in general. So there are lots of people working on this, lots of algorithm development. Uh, so there's a lot of room for, for improvement. I mean, to I would like to say this up front. Now, um, um, in our technology, we do, uh, we, we have added uh, HNE uh, to the exact same tissue. Uh, 
um, we can also add other membrane stainings, for example, uh, to um, to the exact same uh, tissue. So that that can be done or explore. We have done it. Uh, we have done just not standardize it, and uh, so this this can be uh, improved. But um, so I don't think this is a a uh, limitation per se. I, I would like to say what is actually more interesting, maybe to think about. And I, I see that rarely addressed, uh, if ever, in spatial uh, um, uh, technology, is that a lot of the slices that are being used are at, let's say, single cell thickness, um, but will still contain a mixture of different cell types very often, uh, just basically um, 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 a mixture. And so this needs to be deep convolved and and so I think uh, oftentimes uh, when people map single cell data to spatial data is not so easy you know you think it would be easy but it's actually not easy at all and uh, so um, I think one one problem uh, in that it comes from this vertical uh, component which is typically uh, unresolved so I think segmentation we should not only think about it as a hard problem in 2d it is actually, uh, uh, we should actually think about it in 3D. Uh, so that's what uh, we are working on. And uh, I can only say, so time will tell <laughs> how far we can progress. Hopefully yeah. also there will be the community uh, really kicking in. You know, I, I cannot stress this more uh, enough. We are really trying to do something that can be used by and improved and tested and so on by by uh, by others. That's uh, absolutely, I think, essential. That would have been my next question: How difficult that is in three dimensions? You you showed some three D images. Do you need adjacent sections, or can you impute like the missing sections in between? So we um, we used um, uh, mostly adjacent uh, uh, sections. Uh, so, um, uh, but you can impute, and this is again something that uh, we are working on. Uh, and uh, there are also methods known from imaging analysis uh, that can uh, that can do this. Uh, so th I think there's generally a lot of learning to do from from the imaging uh, computational uh, and the, um, now the uh, spatial. Um, methods data it's a very it's also you you can think about using machine learning uh, actually to to predict uh, the uh, spatial uh, structures um all of this is uh, uh, <laughs> going on and i also know that a number of other labs are are working on this uh, so Holger, i think your question is is really spot on for um exciting science right now yeah, I mean, there. I think that there are technical limitations based on the fact that you have to capture molecules from the tissue, as compared to imaging-based methods, for example. Oh, okay. So uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, we capture in a certain way. Uh, if you do imaging, there are also uh, limitations, uh, uh, as you know. I, I don't want to compare it in 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 uh, this regard. Uh, we would certainly. Um, uh, um, if more flow cell, um, let's say, improvement is done uh, that would uh, help in the future how you design these flow cells. It's a very interesting area. I like the sequencing approach uh, because it's uh, agnostic to to uh, uh, what kind of things are there, and uh, it is uh, available in a, in a straightforward way to to most uh, people. So um, these are some things I like, but uh, the imaging approach has other th things which are great to have if you if you uh, if you have it. So it's all um, uh, balance uh, balances uh, that needs uh, need to be considered. Maybe Eric and Maria want to comment a little bit about this as well. I think it's a super exciting computational, like machine learning problem. I think, in, as you said, like in a vision community, there is a lot of this kind of 3D reconstruction from like 2D objects. And I think it's, I mean, so sounds as a super exciting machine learning, I think, uh, problem. Yeah, another thing, maybe back to a prior comment, is that uh, we don't necessarily need to compute the tissue as a bunch of single cells. We can think about it as 
RNA molecules in space is potentially another cell segmentation free approach. And the tissue is fundamentally a combination of different molecules and cells. So modeling in segmentation free ways may also prove a nice alternative approach or approach that augments a lot of these cell-based segmentation methods. Actually, although, you know, uh, just a spontaneous comment, we do segment, right? I mean, so that there are no misunderstandings. Uh, so uh, we, we use uh, software uh, cell pose um, to, to segment. And you can actually show that uh, if you do this, uh, you, get, um, you get really nice results in the sense that if you shift the segmentation mask, uh, the, uh, all kinds of parameters start uh, to, to look worse. Uh, so this is clearly um, uh, working to, to some degree, but it's uh, not perfect, right? Uh, think about uh, neurons and uh, such tissues, and it becomes uh, uh, very hard. If, in particular, if you're interested in, in how neurites are talking to other structures and uh, so on, so there's a way to go. But again, we can also come. We can also add uh, stainings uh, uh, to what we have, or do the stainings in an adjacent tissue, and so on and so, and so forth. Yeah, the other thing I'll highlight is there's new methods like slide tags, which potentially merge single cell and spatial data and get yeah. around some of this segmentation problem. They currently have limitations with scale and coverage, but yes. as these methods advance, we may see yeah. more of a convergence around a lot of these different methods. One comment in this regard, uh, what we have encountered with our uh, 1 million cell uh, virtual tissue block, that a lot of the methods that are out there don't scale, okay? So you run them and it's just not scaling. So, so you know, memory is eaten up or, or they, 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 they just would take a huge amount of time. So you cannot run different parameters and so on and so forth. And maybe if you have unlimited computational resources, it's not, uh, uh, you, can, you can drive this further, but in, in, re in realistic terms, it's a lot of there, what's out there is not uh, scaling. And so I think as a community, we should watch out for this. I think it's a really important discussion um, how we um, proceed in this. Oh, and do you sure. think we need maybe a new, uh, just, okay. Um, maybe I just wanted to just add, like, do you think like we need in this sense, like new, maybe kind of, I don't know, like architectures, like in like mm -hmm. machine learning more sense to be able to kind of scale or we need to like think about, um, I don't know, like how many resources do we need like to train these models? To whom is your question directed? Uh, to, to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, we, we need probably both. Uh, I have no intelligent uh, answer to this uh, question. Uh, I am hoping that the uh, resources needed for, for the training uh, that is done by the uh, big companies uh, becomes available also to others um, somehow. Um, at least uh, for me, you know, I want to do research. <laughs> And uh, in a free way, and uh, so that's what I'm somehow. Yeah, I think one question is how how precise can we be in terms of cell segmentation based on the limitations of the technology, but then also how precise we have to be depending on the application downstream, right? What what you mentioned, mentioned Eric, uh, but then also looking at, for example, the translation into the clinical context into the pathology, digital pathology format, but also for Sam, Eric, for your tools, for drug discovery, um, mm -hmm. drug development. So how do you see where, so where are we today and where kind of that tool set that we're building today is bringing us into the future? I think with the digital pathology, so it's clear that there are um, big advances already possible with what we have right now. Um, it just needs uh, a validation. It needs uh, a systematic analysis of cohorts, and I think that's going on in cooking in 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 uh, uh, many labs. Uh, but then, if you if you talk about uh, research, I, I think uh, we are not there yet. Uh, so we, you know, there are questions. For example, what molecules are transferred between cells? This is super important. 
um, um, uh, on top of the usual uh, signal transduction pathway. So there's, there, there's stuff going on which people know about, is published, but nobody sus can systematically look at this within the uh, spatial data, at least we have uh, right now. It's super difficult. Uh, one limitation I'll point out is that we can often get these downstream clinical samples, but they are often very, very dirty. And finding methods that are actually going to let us work with these really degraded, often poorly annotated samples, it's not necessarily the fanciest, newest technology. It's what's going to be really robust and repeatable mm -hmm. and easy to deploy. And I think we're in the process now of bridging a lot of these new technologies actually into clinical practice, but there's going to be a lot of learning as we do that. Ellen, we have to wrap up, or can Samantha yes. still comment on, on her tool set being applied? And... Yeah, I think we're at time, <laughs> right? Yeah, so with this, we want to thank everyone. Thank you, our panelists. Uh, thank you, the discussion leaders. And thanks uh, for everyone who joined today. Uh, you'll be able to watch this again on YouTube and Billy Billy in a couple of days. And um, please uh, join us uh, uh, at the website, uh, join our Slack channel for discussions, and we'll see you again next time. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you, thank you everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye.